and improving the continuous delivery process of a lot of different projects and uh, teams. Uh, I have to look back because I have no feedback here. Uh, I come from this uh, amazing company uh, where we have a, a fantastic view over the city and uh, we have these uh, kind of parties, many parties, but it's of course, my dear, it's not so pa just parties. We work and one of our strengths, I guess, it's that we deliver fast and with quality. Well, every company can say that, but we achieve this and we think that we are great on that because we just use continuous delivery for helping us. And it's exactly that, that I'm talking here with you today. So this is a big title, uh, full of buzzy words. I'm sure that some people here don't know what is some of these concepts. So for everyone being on the same stage, I will try to explain these concepts. So who knows what is co continuous delivery? Please raise your hand. Okay, almost everyone. Who use continuous delivery today on his company? Okay, less people. So continuous delivery, like the name sounds, it's a process that tries to deliver fast and uh, uh, new features to the clients and bug fix. They achieve that, uh, saying that you should have an artifact that you build uh, with, from your code and then deploy that artifact in several states, running tests against them, against them. And if you can do this often, more times every day, if you can realize that you can deploy for it, uh, whenever the environment that you want uh, any build, you can uh, achieve a, confi a confidence of your uh, quality. And uh, uh, then deploying to production is just click a button. And the, uh, the process to deploy to production should be the same that you use to deploy to uh, QA or staging environments. So what is uh, the advantage of this? It's easy, uh, comparing to waterfall, uh, you, instead of developing during one year, one application and then deliver it to the client, and the client says, no, it's not that that I want. You have more feedback. And be uh, even better, you don't have that kind of big month deploying the application on the client and fix production issues. If you are doing that all the time, every day, it's just click on the button, no problem with that. So, continuous delivery alone uh, can work, but normally it comes with the, his little brother called continuous integration. Who knows what is continuous integration? Okay, apparently less people that know that continuous delivery. Who use continuous integration? A uh, few people. This concerns me. Continuous integration is so easy to implement in your company. It's just every time that you commit and push code to a shared repository, centralized or not, you have some kind of uh, in infrastructure, a machine, impartial one, that picks your code and then run tests, whatever test you want. It's not mandatory having unit tests. You decide, the product is yours, the quality is yours. So you have to run some checks and then if you want, upload the build artifact to some repository. Uh, keep in mind that almost every open source project is today using continuous integration with simple tools like Travis that is free for open source projects or Jenkins that is a free tool. So if you are not using, you are doing it wrong. Well, after that, we have continuous deployment. That is like the nirvana of the process continuous delivery. Well, when you are so confident that your pipeline runs the tests and uh, it's 100% coverage, why, why um, impedes you? Well, it's not even, what stops you from delivering it to production? Nothing, so let's remove the manual button and let uh, ship it. Like uh, you push co uh, code to Git or to Mercurial, whatever uh, repository you are using, and then it passes in all the states of pipeline and is automatically deployed in production. Who are using continuous deployment? Well, we have three, four guys, five guys. Well done, guys. I'm, we no, are not using continuous deployment yet. Uh, Welcome for you. Uh, great, great success. I, I, I have uh, another sentence to say that. Ah, no, of you, no, none of you are using, so what a shame. But great. <laughs> uh, and also there are this concept, DevOps. Who knows what is DevOps? Few people know. 
there are people. Oh, you think, do you know what is? So I will try to understand. Who thinks that DevOps is a job title? No one. <laughs> Who, oh, ah, there are people. <laughs> Who thinks it's a uh, tool suite? Who thinks it's a team? Some people think that it's a team. And who thinks that it's nothing related with that? Okay. So, what DevOps is not? It's not a job position. Come on. So only since uh, 2012, we have uh, RH looking for it. HR looking for it. It's, it's, it's a new position. It's a new unicorn. And check the specs that normally they ask. <laughs> they ask everything. It's like a god. You have to know database, security, network, programming. <laughs> Come on, you want a god? And what do you will pay for it? Well, it's not a team also. So if you want to build a team to fix the problem between develop, uh, developers and operations, you can create some kind of a middle team temporarily to fix them. You pick some guys from there, some guys from the other team, and let's work together, let's improve our communication, our bureaucracy. Okay, that can work if you use that team as a temporary solution. But what impedes you of some time later, you have three walls instead of one. DevOps is not using tools. It's like Agile. If you are using Jira or uh, Trello, yeah. that doesn't mean that you are doing Agile, right? So DevOps is not using tools. It helps, of course. Jenkins is great. There are other tools that are very good, but it's not DevOps using tools. So what is DevOps? There isn't yet, if somewhere, someday will be, a uh, de facto uh, definition. So I picked some from the internet, uh, and I, I choose this one, a culture that aims to break silos between different teams in an IT organization, improving in this way the delivery, quality, and support of software. Smart guy, this guy. Uh, <laughs> well, it's just a culture. So what miss on your companies, for the ones that didn't, uh, are working with this kind of culture, to use DevOps, to, to embrace DevOps? Nothing. You already have people. We just need people to work with DevOps, uh, to embrace the process. The hard thing is that you have to change the mindset of people. You have to go to the ops and say, you have to communicate more with DevOps. <coughs> and you have to go to the devs and say, you have to care about your production deploy. It's not just, it's working my machine and uh, I don't care. Okay, let's back again to the uh, title. What is a immutable server? Who knows what is a immutable server? No one? One, two, three, four, five, six people here knows what is a immutable server. So, a mutable server, that is easier to explain, it's like your laptop. You do change on your laptop every day at every time. You do automatic change when you click on a button to update security fix, for example, or you do manual change when you write a file. Well, a, a server in production is more or less the same thing. You have a mutable server in production that is subject to uh, have change. And this is bad, because like your pep laptop, if I destroy your laptop right now and ask, please build a new, uh, uh, your works, uh, workspace again with all the products that you like, with every application, you can't do that. Unless, of course, you have a cloud image or in, a, in the cloud. <laughs> um, so what is the problem with mutable server? You cannot effectively replicate it, and you cannot, uh, with, uh, you n never know what is the real state of the server. So then appear some tools like Chef, Puppet, and so on. Anyone knows these tools? Yeah, a lot of people, great. These tools try to uh, resolve the problem of a mutable server. So you write, uh, you have a set of hand lists, like a receipt, and uh, you put that receipt on, the, on the, your server and says, run this receipt. And then the server, at least for that receipt, will run exactly what you want. Okay, this fix almost every problem unless you go manually uh, with uh, some connection to the machine and do manual change. So to resolve that problem, it came to the concept of immutable server. Immutable server is something that when it's built, never changes. And to prevent changes, we block human access. 
and can be reproduced, uh, we can reproduce it and we can destroy it like this. So probably database is not a good uh, fit for uh, immutable servers and also don't do this with your laptop, of course, it will <laughs> cost money. Um, immutable servers have so in this theory, the quality of why they are running, they don't change. If you want to make some uh, OS update or update your application build, you have to create another image and then uh, run a service on, based on this new image and destroy the other one, so replacing them. Why? Why is everywhere? You only have a mutable server when it's off. When it's on, some process is writing to the disk, to the RAM, so your service changing. Okay, I'm a liar. No, it's this concept that the internet says. So for our sanity, and so I can continue the, the presentation, please be with me. And the immutable server is the servers that have only chance when they are created, okay? After that, when they start, they have no more automatic or manual chance. So, back into the continuous delivery play with the immutable servers. At Mindedia, we work on, with continuous delivery, and uh, uh, size one year, we start with playing with immutable servers. Our CD pipeline is like this first stage. Build, create a product image, then create a QA infrastructure, and if we do tests and it's everything okay, we promote it to production, creating a new immutable cluster in production. Build its continuous integration, like I told you before. There is no magic here. Uh, the only tweak probably is that we, our artifact from the continuous integration process is an RPM, that is a package specific for a CentOS distribution of Linux, and then we upload that artifact, but could be a JAR or a NPM model, um, to a YAM repository. Then, it's where the magic starts to be. We create a product image. That is, we take a base image, a raw CentOS image or some image that we have some custom configurations, uh, some packages that we always need, like for example, Java uh, to run web servers, and then we, with Chef, with the help of tools like Chef, uh, we pick the RPM that was on the repository and install on the system. Then we say, Amazon, because we work with Amazon Web Service, create please an Amazon machine image from this instance, and then we have a clone of the state that we really want to run in production. That will be our artifact to run in our pipeline from dev to production. Even if you can, you can download, if you want, you can download the, the image and try to run it on your laptop with Vagrant or other virtual machine provider or framework. Well, after we have this product, AMI, Amazon machine image, um, <coughs> we create what we call a immutable cluster. For us, immutable cluster is a load balancer uh, that have a resistor, an auto-scaling group of instances, based all that distance based on the same AMI that we just created. And we uh, spin up this cluster and then resistor to the DNS root 53 uh, of Amazon so it can be exposed to the internet with a good name. Well, if something goes wrong here, what happens is that the cluster is all destroyed. So no zombie machines, no zombie configuration on the, on the Amazon, um, uh, our account of Amazon. So after this, we do tests against this new cluster. And if it passes, we go to the production. Wait, is that the same image? Exactly. We deploy to production in the same way that we deploy to development or key stage. And this is so important because we are, have a trust on our process that we can click in a button with uh, our highest closer. We trust a lot in our process because we repeat a lot in key A staging. Okay, so then, sorry, this is a dashboard of Jenkins of one of our products. I have more than the four stages that I told you, but the princip principle is the same. And then, one good thing is the rollback. Rollback is exactly like the production deploy. You just click in a button. How? So, if you are with uh, a buggy 205 version, you click on the button of 200, 
And then it creates a new cluster in production with the build 200, based on a, the AMI, AMI that you just created before. And then you flick the DNS from one production cluster to the another. It's very easy. Even you can not create the, the production cluster. You can keep the, the last production cluster sometime online, online, but without traffic to it. So if you can even do a rollback process faster. That is just flick the DNS without creating the, the infrastructure. How often is this, right? Apparently you don't like that, right? <laughs> well, I will not uh, try in a lot of details because I guess that a lot of people here are already seeing a lot of uh, new words, etc. So if you want to discuss any details, I'm happy to do it after the, the talk. But for now, I will show you the high-level pros and cons of this approach. First one, problem one is the baking time or image, image creating time. So the difference between immutable and the mutable uh, creation of a machine is that when you use immutable, you need to start the instance, then baking the instance, uh, provisioning the instance, and then asking, otherwise, create this image from the, the instance, uh, create this image from the instance that is running. Here. With mutable servers, it's faster because the server is already running, so you just provision it. Well, other problem is environment configuration. Remember when I say that production and de development is the same process? It is. But of course, there are some tweaks, difference between them. Production needs more power, more CPU, more RAM. And production have different connections uh, from QA. They connect to different databases, they connect to different endpoints, they have different passwords, etc. So how to fix this? I, f I guess there are at least two ways. One, it's cheating the immutable process. Well, <laughs> you put every configuration that you want on the image, protects all passwords. If no one can access to them, what is the problem of being on the machine? So then when you populate the image on the QA environment, you say, this instance is a QA, and then on spin up, we run a, a cloud init software that is a, a software dedicated for sp when, spin up, uh, when instances are spinned in cloud, run some uh, scripts. And then what it does is just changing the symbolic links of configuration. It's not uh, a big change, right? It's just changing uh, configuration. Well, but this is not, like I said, it's cheating. So a more honest situation is it's using service discovery mechanisms and uh, ask your application to another application that has to be always uptime. So there are that problem. Hey, give me the configuration for production. Hey, I'm a QA. Give me the production for QA. Well, that is the another solution. There is no magic here. And the third problem, no access to the machines. Well, how you can debug production issues? How you can clean disk space? How many of you already have a production problem because the disk are full? Right? So how you clean that? You can't. You have to destroy the instance, and the autoscaling group spins an another one easy like that. So it's not really a problem, but it is if you want to do big debug stuff. But I will try to resolve with another advantage uh, later. So advantage one, wait, no SSH to machines. Is that wasn't a problem? Yeah, right, but better. Your security team will be more than happy. No one have access pr to production. It's the nirvana for them, right? No security team is needed more <laughs> because if no one have <laughs> uh, security access uh, to the machine production, uh, production machine, it's everything okay. And uh, there are another big change here. It's that no hammer time. What this means? In Portuguese, we call it marteladas in production. <laughs> well, <laughs> no more marteladas in production. And this is very good because you know that no one will change something that don't tell to teammates. This is really very important. This is not really an uh, advantage, centralism monitoring, because you can do also with the <laughs> mutable servers. But with the mutable servers, you need, it's mandatory. Because if you cannot log in on the, on the machine, you have to retrieve somehow the logs and the metrics of them. And then use fantastic software over there 
uh, open source or not, like uh, Splunk and LK stack for logs, or New Relic or Statful for metrics, or NASIS for uh, monitoring, etc. Another big advantage of this is the pipeline parallelization. Uh, imagine this, you have a mutable continuous pipeline. You have the build number 10 deployed, and you need to run tests against that. The test takes one hour. So the build 11 will have to wait one hour until the build 10 be finished to uh, be installed again on the mutable server, right? With pipelines parallelization, we can create two clusters at the same time and run tests against them at the same time. We gain a lot of time with that. Even better, imagine that you have a meeting and you want a stable environment that, just for you, for commit, let's do this, put super product uh, for commit port, build number 10 in a cluster so I can show to you. Why not? It's very easy. And of course, money. Uh, auto scaling gives us money or at least avoids us to spend more money that it's needed. In two ways, first, it scales, scales out, so it creates more machines when our site is with a lot of traffic. Uh, imagine a mutable infrastructure, you have to go there and ask directly, hey, I need more machines, and that can take time to spin up, and then they have to be provisioned, and then they are different from the other machines. So in this way, it's completely, it's exactly the same with just automatic process of scaling out. But imagine then in the night that no one is using in your site. You don't want 200 computers spending money, right? So it scales in. It's destroying instance like that. There are a lot of more advantages, like the easy and fast rollback that I told you before. There is this also big advantage that you just provision once. Remember when they say that it takes a lot of time? Yeah, it takes a lot of time to create a machine. But it's just once, and it, it, because it's just once, it, if you have problems you, uh, with networking, you will recreate the machine again. Imagine that you have 200 computers, and you want to run a provisioning uh, task in all of them. Like, for example, update Java 7 to 8 in the 200 computers. And some of them start to have network problems. Then you have some computers with Java 8, and then another with Java 7. That is not right. With this, we provision once, you install Java 8, and then you spin up the 200 <coughs> machines from that image. The, wa the last advance that I will talk here, that is so amazing, is the next level of immutable servers. It's like uh, what Netflix does. Anyone knows what is Charles Monkey? Okay, 10 people. Charles Monkey is a software that creates in purpose, failures on production infrastructure. It just destroys randomly machines. So who, who is crazy like that? The people that trust on their process, on their cluster infrastructure. We are not just yet there, but probably in less than here we will implement something like this. Well, it's this, guys. I have more, no more time to, to talk. Uh, I, I guess that uh, you should uh, look for uh, uh, the, the uh, outside your EDA. There are a lot of magic on operations, a lot of going here, there. Uh, even, I, I never uh, talk about containers here, but the container is a immutable server as well, a light, a lightly one with a, a small uh, blueprint. Uh, so please start using uh, these amazing tools like uh, Vagrant, Docker, Chef, and help operations doing their job because. Only that you can achieve continuous delivery in a good way. Thank you. <laughs> questions? So questions over there. Someone with a mic. And over there also. Uh, we can start by there. Should I start? No. First of all, here. Uh, raise your hand. Oh, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have just one simple question. Um, you say that with the immutable servers, rolling back uh, a build, it's easy as pressing a button. Yeah. But what happens 
if your new build uh, is, is incompatible with your previous one. For example, you have a database server that you don't deploy in an immutable server, and your old version and your new version yeah. are incompatible. Uh, I understand the question, and uh, that is one of the biggest problems with continuous delivery. What I always try to say, and it's not easy, is that when you release a new version, and you have to be retrocompatible with the old one, right? And if you do that, imagine you uh, deploy a new database version. You keep the retrocompatibility, so the servers online will be okay. If a new version of your website uses a new version of database, it can use because the database is already released. So you have to deploy first the dependency and then the, the parent, uh, the parent, no, the, the software that needs that dependency. It's not okay, it's not easy to do because there is no time to do back, <laughs> back uh, uh, compatibility normally. Justify that for product owners, it's difficult, but it's the way to go, I guess. It's okay for you, the answer? Yeah, I okay. think, thank you. Okay. Just for Mike Logistics over there and then over there, okay? He'll kill me afterwards, don't worry. Okay, yeah. so uh, if the service you're deploying uses cache, how do you handle cold caches in this scenario? Okay, uh, imagine, uh, for me, immutable servers is just for stateless machines. Everything that you have database of something cached, well, you will be some bigger problem to deal with it. This is easy for websites, uh, web servers, sorry, that, for example, deliveries uh, Angular uh, application, just uh, that. For stateful applications, it's a, another big talk to talk here, and uh, if you want, we, we can discuss later. But it's a big problem, and it's not easy to respond, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay, over there. Uh, thanks for the presentation, I enjoyed. But um, I want to want to just say something. Uh, if you are in staging, it's yeah. good to go latest and make microservices. But if you are in production, you should freeze the versions, right? And that process of, of freezing versions, it's manual. Do you what, agree with that? What do you mean with freezing versions? Okay, so if you are, for example, uh, if you are building Docker images and you are tagging them with smatting version, and you have a stack of uh, 20 microservices, uh, and in staging, you have a set of versions that were working, okay, version A of service A, version two of service B. Yeah. Uh, in production, you should lose that versions and not go with latest because if you are developing new features, you cannot automatically, automatically de deploy to production the latest version. But I'm only saying this if you want a lot of services, right? Uh, so I, 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 I'm saying this because you said everyone should use continuous deployment in production, and that is not true in some scenarios, okay? Okay, to continuous deployment, uh, of course, I expect your opinion. Continuous deployment, it's not easy for every situation. For example, mobile. For example, desktop applications. However, there are a lot of mechanisms to prevent you uh, deploying in production stuff that you don't want. Exactly, is that, that you, features that are not finished, right? Like toggles. Like, uh, it's put a if on the code. If toggle on, don't do this. If toggle off, do. <laughs> Something like that. It's not easy for every case, but in our experience, and I have to say what is my experience, of course, uh, it's doable, right? And if you want to uh, deploy, uh, you can continue in pushing features, new features for master, but you just have to hide them with some kind of toggle. If they are not breaking, it's good, but if of they course. are breaking, you need to smutting version, you need to freeze the versions of all the microservices. And that is going with the same problem yeah, over there. Database, it's, if you are changing that device. It's very similar. But with versions, you can always hide your code. Facebook does that. And then do A-B testing, for example. Instead of a toggle, you use a throttle, right? It's, it's not easy, but it's doable, so. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Anyone else? Any question? Uh, Tiago, there. Hi, thank Hi, you Jack. for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, one of the main challenges that you described was the time that it took to, to create the images. Uh, the virtual images. Uh, have you all considered using Docker to surpass that issue? Yeah, uh, the problem with Docker is that our company it's have not yet the enough knowledge, knowledge to use it in production. We don't want to use something in development that then we don't use in production. So Docker is still young, it's still uh, technology to be proven. Docker, Mesos, Kubernetes, etc. 
there are few companies that using, are using that in production. So we, are, we like to be in cutting, cutting edge, but not right there. And I guess that with this kind of uh, no access to machines, centralized mo monitoring, etc., moving to Docker is an easy step of changing how we do the machines. So probably next year, I can talk with you that we are doing Docker stuff and containers and etc. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Joan. Thank you.